Well, good morning. Um, how many of you are still awake? Yeah, you're doing pretty good. Uh, welcome to uh, Living the Brand for Customer Service, uh, pro promising our customers uh, an, an, an experience. Now, how many of you are still maybe a little sleepy or everybody's doing pretty good? I'm not, I'm not going to trust that. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a game. I need everybody to stand up. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to stand behind the microphone while I explain this. So, how many of you are good at rock, paper, scissors? Oh, sorry. Everybody knows how to play that game, rock, paper, scissors? Well, this is going to be the full body adult version of rock, paper, scissors. And it's called Man Gorilla Net. So, here's how it works. Man takes the net, net takes the gorilla, net takes the gorilla, <coughs> so you have to make the sound. Okay. And for the man you have to say yes sir, yes sir. Okay. And the net, you can do better than that, very good. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to find a partner and you're going to stand back to back with them. And I want you to be real careful about uh, where you're standing. To make sure you're not going to be on something you're going to trip on. And on the count of three, you're going to spin around and you're going to make your man grow a gun. So it'll be one, two, three, and you'll go. And you'll, you'll already be making your, your, your sign. You'll either be a man, you'll be a gorilla, or you'll be a net. Okay? So find a partner. It can be somebody so near you. Okay? Okay, yeah, and let me explain that. So again, Man takes the net because he's got opposable thumbs, and that's what the man's supposed to do with the net. The net takes the gorilla because that's what the net is designed to do. The gorilla takes the man because he's 800 pounds and can beat the snot out of the man. Okay? It's perfect. It's logical. So here we go. On the count of three. Oh, hold on. Uh, Michael, would you mind flipping that light switch up? It'd be better for his picture. There we go. On the count of three. Everybody has their partner? Anybody without a partner? You don't have a partner? Well, you got one over here. Okay. There we go. All right, on the count of three, you're going to spin around. You're not going to you're not going to knock the other person in the head with your gesture and you're not going to fall down, right? We're good. On the count of three. One, two, three. All right, how do you go? How many of you how many of you tied? Okay, on this next round, don't choose the same thing. Okay, it's as easy as that. Okay, so now, are there any questions about how to play the game? Because now we're into single elimination. If you win, you're a winner, and you get to keep playing. If you lose, you're a loser, and you have to sit down. Okay, I know, I know, but that's, it's competitive, right? Okay, this is all about bragging rights right now. Who in the state of Texas is going to be our man gorilla net champion? That's what I want to know. There we go. One, two, three. <laughs> All right. If you're a winner, find another winner. If you tie, you're going to play again. If you lost, sit down. All right. Okay, so we're already seeing we're already seeing some of the weaker creatures falling away. Ready? One, two, three. Alright. If you're a winner, you should be very proud of yourself. If you're a loser, sit down in shame. Alright? If you tie, well, tying is like kissing your sister. So there we go. One, two, three. Alright. Winners, go find another winner. If you tied, let's break the tie. Alright, ready. Find it. Yeah, oh, we have any singles? Okay, you, you earned a buy. You've got a buy. Yeah, that's good. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> All right. You're both 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Eye of the tiger, baby. That's what we're talking about now. One, two, three. Okay. Oh, look at this. This quarterfinals. One, two, three. Yes, sir. Oh, that was that was a semifinal. Okay. All right. Now, before you guys go, before you guys play, um, who's who and where are you from? I'm James Turner. I'm from the city of Arlington. Okay. Aaron Dobson, city of Rockwell. Okay. Uh, how many want to see Arlington win? Yeah. yeah. Rockwell? Rockwell. Oh, here we go. So you're the underdog. <laughs> One, two, three. probably going to hear a lot of uh, a lot of ideas on what branding means and I'm going to tell you in California how we developed the branding uh, uh, logo or the logo the, the branding promise of parks make life better that's what in California we're using uh, it was developed by the California Park and Recreation Society for all professionals uh, to be able to use in the state of California uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the process uh, <coughs> went along here. So, why is having a brand important? Anybody? Why do you want to have a brand to begin with? Recognition. Recognition. Giving your organization an identity. Identity, yeah. Anything else? It's cool. It's cool? Yeah, it is. It is kind of cool. The goal for Parks and Recreation is to be valued as an essential community service. Michael, can you get that? that better? Okay. Uh, in your organization, how many of you are with a city? Okay, anybody here, do you guys even have special districts in uh, Texas? No, so it's, you're either with a municipality or a county? Is that correct? Okay. Uh, in your, especially for the, uh, for the cities, who's viewed as your essential service in, in your organization? Police and fire. They're the ones that are viewed as the essential service. What's their brand? Their cars. Their cars. Their trucks. Yeah, uniforms. Their lights on the top. Their sirens. Uh, if it's police, maybe their canine units. Uh, and what are they, I mean, beyond all the physical stuff, what else is there about their brand? What is it there? What's their purpose? Safety. Protect and serve. Protect and serve. Anything a little more basic? How about to help people? That's their job. They help. You need help, they're there. They help. That's their brand. So with brand loyalty, we have funding, and, and of course, police and fire, they, they usually get a lot of funding, right? Uh, they have programs. Um, uh, how many of your police have uh, police athletic leagues? Or fire, they've got some sort of fire program, a junior firefighter program, something like that. Yep, they have that. Uh, they usually have positive growth. Uh, when it comes to budget cuts, they're usually the ones that aren't getting as cut as other programs. I know that in California, in uh, well, we had Prop, Prop 13 in the 70s, and that pretty much wiped out a lot of the um, social services and the, and the quality of life services. And then we had what was called ERAF in the uh, early 90s, and that's where uh, the governor said, we're going to start taking back some of the, the tax dollars that you're receiving. And a lot of places lost their library services, or they lost their, uh, their, they lost their, their mental health uh, facilities. Uh, organizational health. Uh, how strong is your, your police or fire department? And there's a brotherhood there, am I right? I mean, they're very tight. You've got, uh, you know, and it, and it helps when you're kind of a paramilitary because everybody buys into that. And then you've got community involvement. How many of you have, uh, in, in West Sacramento, we have CERT. We've got CERT um, uh, civilians who are, are involved in being uh, 
part of the, uh, you know, they, they know first aid, they know CPR, they're, they're there to help, they, they, they get to wear uniforms, they go to meetings. Uh, so there's some community involvement. Uh, firefighters, they have open houses at the, at the fire stations and they, uh, at any special event, they bring out the, the, the trailer that they fill with smoke and they show people how to get out of a, out of a smoke-filled room or they uh, talk about safety by <coughs> showing people how to use fire extinguishers. They do that, right? They get the community involved. Don't we do some of this stuff too? I mean, aren't we an essential service? And I would like to say that we are an essential service. When you need help, you want fire to, to be there, and, and that's why they get this. But how many of you would believe that your department <coughs> probably receives more phone calls in the course of the day than police or fire? And is it because they're desperate for your help? No, they're probably not in need of being saved from anything, but they really want your services. They need your services. It's, it's part of quality of life, why we exist as Parks and Recreation. What a brand is not, it's not a product. It's not, if, if, you're, uh, if you're an oil company, it's not gasoline. If you're, uh, if you're, uh, if you're Nike, it's not shoes. That's not your brand. It's not a logo and a mark. So the Nike swoosh, that's not their brand. That's what they're recognized. It's, 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 it's how people connect the product to the company. And it's not what the company says it is. You can tell people that this is what you're going to do for their lives all day long. And as soon as you don't do it, they're not going to believe you anymore. Um, I, I had a slide in this earlier that had to do with BP. And uh, I, I thought, well, I'm not sure I want to talk about that in, a, in an oil state. <laughs> but would you say that BP's brand has been tarnished since the, uh, uh, the Horizon event in the Gulf? It has. And so BP can talk about how they're energy friendly and they're doing it, but what people remember is, is the oil spill and, and how they, you know, how it happened. And, and, and the effect that had on everybody uh, that was in the Gulf. It's not just a slogan. So, you know, you may uh, give me a slogan for a company. Anybody think of one offhand? Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Okay, so it's, that's not a brand. It's a slogan, and and it may resonate with some people, but it's not it's not what a brand is. The most powerful and enduring brands are built from the heart. If people believe they share the values with a the company, they will stay loyal to a brand. Uh, how many of you love Starbucks? How many of you are loyal to Starbucks? Why are you loyal to Starbucks? It's good. It's addictive. It's addictive. It's a habit. Okay. Plus they have good coffee. Okay, they have good coffee. Um, it's convenient. It's convenient. Okay, so there's a lot of things you like about it, but if that Starbucks closed and a pizza opened up or a Caribou opened up, would you Java City? Would you would you go there? No. If it was the same, basically the same store, and they just you know different logos. No. You wouldn't. No. Really? How many of you like Starbucks because of their uh, how uh, how green they are? You know, they're very environmentally uh, sensitive. Any of you care about that? Yeah. A couple of people are nodding. Raise your hand if you care about that. Is that one of the reasons why you connect with Starbucks? <laughs> okay. Uh, how about when you go in, how you feel? Do you like when you go in? Do you like the atmosphere, the built environment, the the music playing, the, uh, the baristas? Is that how you pronounce that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, you, you like all of that? It's the modern day cheers. They know you. Modern, okay. They know you. How many of you who go to Starbucks, have you ever had this happen where you go in and, and as soon as you walk in, they're already making your drink because they know what you like. You like that, right? Oh, yeah. There you go. Branding is about emotional connections. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to uh, get into groups of four or so. And I want you to talk about these things. What's your favorite restaurant? Favorite room in your house? Favorite personality, so you know somebody, an actor, musician, politician, athlete, community can be anybody. 
uh, your favorite retail store. Let's take about five minutes and just talk about those. I want it to be, think about it, what is it, or who is it, and why do you feel that way about them? So go ahead and get the little groups. I don't have a den. 
Or a I have to get one now. Family rear end. Okay, but the, but the den, why the den? Because it's been family together, so it's always downtime. Alright, there you go. Enjoy your silly buddy. Uh, any other rooms? The restroom. The restroom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's a good If it were for restrooms, we'd never play scramble or words with friends. <laughs> uh, what about favorite personality? Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp? Really? Okay, why? I'm Good, good. Anybody else? Favorite personality? We had a, we had a good Who? one. Who? Christopher Walken. Really? I, I love him too. I just never would think anybody would say him. <laughs> How about uh, favorite retail store? Target. Target, Ross, Dillard, Ross, and Costco. Costco. Okay, and why all of those? Because that's what we're prices. Prices, so value, what else? One stop shop. One stop shop. Customer service. Customer service. Clean. 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 That's good to hear. Then don't go to California to go to Ross. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, uh, a little bit about this whole uh, branding process, and on, and on your sheet, you know, again, that, that uh, the branding mark is on the uh, upper right-hand corner on the front and the back, and one side is the uh, uh, Y brand uh, worksheet, and the other side, is, but I didn't point that out to you, so just so you know. Um, the, uh, the branding process, actually, for, for uh, California Park and Recreation Society, CPRS, uh, really started back uh, in the late 90s, about 1999 or so, uh, when they created the, the, uh, the VIP plan, the Vision, Insight, and Planning. It was the strategic plan for the profession, and it was something that professionals could use to help articulate the value of parks and recreation uh, in California. Um, it, it helped by uh, identifying core values, and then it went into a vision, which was we create community through people, parks, and program, and then below that, it got into mission objectives, uh, and it just—it's just this beautiful framework. It's very simple, but 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 right on point. And it was CPRS did the research. Uh, they researched not only parks and recreation professionals, but uh, from folks in uh, uh, like uh, uh, organizations and and professions. Uh, on what those values would be and what those mission objectives would be. And the whole vision statement of we create community through people, parks, and programs was the first thing that most professionals in California felt really articulated briefly what it was that parks and recreation does. The problem was they started to use it as a slogan or as a, a way to tell people what they were doing. And while it resonates with us, it's not so good with the public. You know, we create community through people, parks, and programs. It's not like just do it. It's not real short. It doesn't really have a punch. So that's when uh, CPRS thought, well, let's start working on a brand because that sounds like that's what people really want. And it took about another 10 years for them to get that process going, but they started doing market research on, on what, what is a brand and what is it that we could use as a brand. So instead of asking professionals, they asked residents in California, what is it that you value about parks? You know, do you value parks and recreation? And if you do, what is it? And through all of the, they, had, they hired two companies, two firms to do all the research. And what they came back with was that people kept talking about how it made their lives better. And so the company worked through a couple of phrases, went out and tested them, and that what came back was what you see on your paper there, parks make life better. That's what the residents, about 10,000 in California, that sampling were saying about parks that make life better. And wouldn't you think that would be the case in just about every state? If you offer parks, if you have programs, that, that's what makes life better. It doesn't say parks and recreation make life better. Uh, what they also found was that people just say parks. You, you know, the recreation people shouldn't be offended by that. And, uh, my example to my staff is, 
you know, we're, we're West Sacramento Parks and Recreation. But whenever the public refer to us, they just refer to us as parks. They know what they mean. So we need to understand that and not, not be offended that recreation isn't in there. So parks make life better. So that's kind of how they, they got there. So we're about three years into the brand assessment. That's where we are today. Um, the brand promise, and that's what we're calling it, parks make life better. It's not just what they're saying. We're now saying that's what we're going to do. We're going to make park. We're going to make parks better for your life. It is now a promise. Uh, how we will get it done? That's 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 in the slide. It's mainly for people in in, in California that are using this right now. And it's um, you know how are you going to bring that into your into your organization and how are you going to use it? What's your plan? Are you simply going to say yeah we're just going to stick it on everything and call it good, or are you actually going to think about how you're going to use this strategically uh, to, to maximize the impact. Brand culturalization, promise is integrated into everything. Um, does it need to be everywhere? How many of you get logo sickness? You, you see your, your logo plastered everywhere, it's like, okay, enough, we, we, you know, we're, we're, we're oversaturating our, our mark. Um, and, and so what I've told my staff is, let's put it where it makes sense. We don't, it doesn't have to be on every page in our activity guide. It could be on a few pages. It doesn't have to be on every single uh, page in our website. It can be on a few pages. Uh, let's put it where people land first. You know, that's where it needs to be. Maybe we can have it in a few other places, but it doesn't have to be everywhere. Uh, brand advantage is the end result. We now have a brand that, that resonates with people because the sampling tells us that's what people say about parks. So, Parks and recreation makes lives and communities better now, better now and in the future. And I believe on your worksheet, it says parks and recreation in makes your lives better. That blank, that's where you should be putting your agency's name. So there's, there's the answer. Did you like it in school when a teacher would say, okay, the answer to this one on this test is this. It was great, it was a freebie. It's kind of like this. But you should already know that, right? I mean, you know hopefully you know that your agency really uh, makes the lives of your residents better and it, it makes the community a, a better place. Yesterday morning listening to, to Rick talk about all of the great things they're doing in Grand Prairie, how many people sat through that one? Yeah. Uh, anybody, if, if you're already from Grand Prairie you know this, but if you're not from Grand Prairie, weren't you a little jealous? Yes. Yeah. You know, oh, man, I wish we could do that stuff. I wish we could figure out ways to do this. and and. Um, you know that's something they're making their their community better. You probably have things if you could come up and share them with us. We would all be wondering why couldn't we do those things too. Um, so it makes lives uh, in the, uh, makes lives and communities better by access to serenity and inspiration of nature. How many of you have beautiful parks and parks where people go to get away from suburbia or from your urban cores? Uh, my daughter, my daughters and I take our dogs down to uh, the American River at Ansel Hoffman Park. It's the park I grew up in. And uh, while my daughters aren't real nature nuts, um, and, and I love being in, you know, I love camping and love backpacking, uh, we enjoy that together, and that's our opportunity to get away. And if it weren't for that park, uh, and the fact that we knew that we could go there, it, you know, we would, they would miss out on that, and I wouldn't get that opportunity to spend with them. Uh, outdoor space to uh, play and exercise. How many of you uh, saw in the paper this last week the, uh, the challenge that the city of Santa Monica in California is having with uh, one of their parks being taken over by boot camps? And did you read that? They have the same problem. Yeah. And uh, I was in Austin in uh, July, and they were having the same, the same problem there. They have a, a, a park near... Uh, the river walk or the, 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 the riverfront, and uh, they've got boot camps that are always out there. They're not getting permission to go out, they're not, they're not asking. Um, and it's a problem. But that's kind of one of the, the burdens we have. And I would rather have positive activity taking place in a park than negative activity. How many of you have homeless in your, in your parks? You know, we, we have a couple of parks where that's a real issue for us. If we can get more positive activity going on in those parks, we're hoping that those people will find other places to, to stay. Um, but we have these outdoor spaces to play and exercise. Uh, facilities for self-directed and organized recreation. How many of you have rec centers? Community centers? Yeah. And so people can come in and they can either get a personal trainer or they can be in a program like a basketball league or, 
uh, sports camp for kids, or they can go in and they can work out on their own and they can figure out what they want to do. Positive alternatives for youth, which help lower crime and mischief. Our recreation center is a joint use facility with the high school. And we've only got one high school in West Sacramento with 44,000 people. Um, and so that one high school serves about 2,500 students. Uh, and our recreation center is right there. And we have students who didn't have anything to do before our recreation center opened up. It was too far to go over to the teen center. Uh, and so they would either stay on campus at the old high school site, or they would, uh, they would just go find something else to do. And it wasn't always positive. And you all know that. When you can provide a place for kids to go, crime <coughs> supposedly goes down. Activities that facilitate social connections, human development, the arts and lifelong learning. I always tell my staff that the real value in a basketball program uh, in any sports program isn't the fact that they're out there playing, it's they're, they're, they're seeing each other, they're being together. Uh, and we need to figure out ways to, to make those interactions more positive. Uh, you know, so anytime we get them together when they're not playing, you know, for meetings, for socials, we should be doing that. Uh, we're doing a, a, a focus group, uh, in fact, it's in two weeks. Uh, and we're going to be getting people together. And one of the things I want to do with this is all the people that are on Facebook, I want to get all the Facebook people together. You, you may talk to each other. You may have made friends with each other. But how often are you actually seeing each other face to face? Some of them, yes. But some of them, no. So parks make life better. And we have our recreation center. And could you, I'm sorry, could you hit that light again? The West Sacramento Recreation Center. And again, one of the things was if parks make life better, that's what this has to do. This has to make our, this has to make our residents' lives better. Uh, we, we built it and uh, we opened in 2009, uh, so we haven't been open very long. Uh, we've tried to provide a variety of amenities, uh, you know, healthy vending. Uh, we don't have concessions on site, we got healthy vending. Small pro shop, we got those items that are more of convenience. There's a target across the street, but uh, you know, if somebody shows up and they don't have socks or they don't have, uh, they don't have goggles to go swimming or something, we've, we've got a few convenient items for them. Um, information right here, old school style. Um, we provide child care uh, and we've got friendly front desk staff. Uh, we've never had, we used two uh, school pools before we uh, had this and, and as soon as we opened up these pools, the schools uh, filled the old pools in with dirt and covered over. They were done having pools. One was leaking, the other one was always, uh, it was just uh, more of a, a crime scene at times. Um, and, uh, you know, so we went from not having any, anything fancy like this to, to being a full-blown aquatic facility. Uh, we have uh, a fitness area, strength and uh, fitness right here. So people have a variety, it's only about 3,000 square feet, it's probably, it's probably maybe just a tad bigger than this room, it's not that big, uh, but it's always busy. Um, group exercise room, boot camp, Zumba, you name it, uh, kinesis, uh, all of our, all, almost all of our equipment is techno gym, and I know Grand Prairie in your, uh, your summit you have techno gym, so it was kind of exciting to see somebody else having that equipment. Uh, and uh, with, with each of these, it's... Uh, uh, we have kinesis classes and they're, they're very social so that that seems to be why that continues to be popular. Rock climbing, uh, we've got gymnasium so we've got basketball and, and volleyball going on in there, dodgeball um, and we've got tennis courts. But really this is why people keep coming back to to our recreation center and it's our frontline staff. It's the people, you know, just like John was talking about this morning, it's the, it's the people you come in contact with. Uh, if these people aren't doing their job well, if they're not friendly, if they're not solving, helping people solve their problems, um, then they're not, you know, we're, we're not going to do good business and they're not helping us deliver on that grand promise. So these people help us deliver on the grand promise. So what is customer service? Uh, this is a, from a book called Total Customer Service, The Ultimate Weapon. It came out in the late 90s, and um, I teach at Sacramento State, and one of the classes I taught, I, I 
used this book, and I may have used it for the last time. Uh, when, when a book starts to refer to changes at the People Express, anybody remember that airline, People Express? Uh, or they talk about mainframe computers, it's probably a little old, but a lot of the, a lot of the strategies and uh, principles in customer service are really laid out well in this book. Uh, if you get it, buy it cheap. Uh, customer service means all features, acts, and information that augment the customer's ability to realize the potential value of a core product or service. So it's not just your front staff. They are very important and they have to do their job and they have to do it well. But there are other things that help you deliver on customer service. Yeah. Okay, I noticed that the last time I gave this presentation was probably uh, probably three months ago and I noticed for the first time this, this right here. Somebody else got served, but I didn't. So intentional customer service companies that provide outstanding customer service don't do it by dumb luck. They manage to do it. And I emphasize manage. Uh, they put into action the six elements of customer service, strategy, leadership, personnel policies, design, infrastructure, man and measurement. Um, if you don't have a customer service plan and if you don't have customer service training for your staff, you need to do that. It's just something that you need to implement. Um, it's always great when you hire somebody and they seem to do everything right, but how often does that happen? Oftentimes, people need to be coached along. They need some help. And if you can't get them out of the gate doing most things right, uh, then you're just, you know, entropy. It's, it's, it's just going to get worse and worse. How many of you have heard of Pluto's? And are there any Pluto's in Texas? Okay, Pluto's is a, a, I guess it's, I guess it would be a Mexican food restaurant. I'm not really sure because I, I honestly have never eaten there. But there, it's in a, it's in a mall by our, uh, by where we live, and there's a Barnes and Nobles next door. My, when my daughter would want to go look at books, we'd go in and we'd see this. And I finally decided to read this, and and I love what it says. And I know you can't read it in the back, so I'll read it. So the ones I circled, uh, and this is what they have for all of the customers to see. Uh, we are committed to neighborhoodly service, we are part of the community, and we only want to make it a better place. Second one here, you come first, second, and third, always, always, always. We keep our planet as tidy and fresh as our food. We are committed to improving our products and services. Your feedback, uh, your, your opinions and feedback are our lifeline. When you are willing to stick out there for the public to see what you're, what you're committed to doing and what your values are, you've made yourself a pretty big target. You know, the first one here, they're, 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 it resonates with us. You know, neighborhoodly service. We want to make a community a better place. Isn't that us? Isn't that what we do? You come first, second, third, always, always, always. I would hope that we would all take that that, uh, that point of view with our customers. We keep our planet as tidy and fresh as our food. Uh, I know that for uh, West Sacramento, very green community, uh, very aggressive in recycling. There's a lot of green technology things going on in, in our community. So a lot of people are buying into that. And so when a company comes in and says, you know, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna treat the environment well, we're gonna have a great working environment that's safe and clean for our employees, people like to hear that. We are committed to improving our products and services. This is the best part. Your opinions and feedback are our lifeline. And I tell my staff all the time, and it's a quote, uh, customer complaints are the textbooks from which we learn. That if, if we don't hear complaints, then we're not going to know where we need to make improvements. So complaints are a gift. We need to be looking for those complaints, even the little ones, the things that seem petty. You know, I don't like the fact that that fan in the locker room uh, is, is on all the time and, and it's a little noisy. Uh, you know, the, the lighting is flickering in the corner. You know, we may look at those and think, well, that's a maintenance problem. Somebody ought to get on that. But it's bothering the customer. Why don't we go and take care of that? And then why don't we go and tell the customer, hey, did you notice we took care of that? So remember the, uh, that earlier quote, 
talked about the six elements, so we're going to kind of go through those real briefly here. So a customer service strategy, do a self-analysis of your agency, be brutally honest. Go back and sit down with your staff. And don't, don't have it be just your full-time staff. Bring in some of the part-timers who are interacting with the public. And, you know, do an analysis. Hey, how are we doing? Do you have all the tools you need frontline staff? You know, people that are, uh, that, that, um, that are in charge of the frontline staff. What, are you getting any complaints about your staff? And, and be brutally honest, where do we need to do better? What would you like to see different? And that's where your frontline staff are gonna be great. You may put into place policies and procedures that make sense to you. Do they work for your frontline staff? You know, are, have frontline staff figured out shortcuts and, and more efficient ways of doing things that may not really jive with your, with your policy or your procedures? Identify the obstacles that stand in the way. And this may be even in your built environment. You know, when people walk in your building, is it convenient to go in? We had, uh, we built a, the, the recreation center. And per ADA, we made sure that uh, the resistance on the door had so many pounds per, I forget what it was. It was so many you know, pounds of resistance, that's what it was. And so somebody who was in a wheelchair should theoretically still be able to go up, pull the door open, and wheel themselves in. But we had one lady who said, it doesn't work for me. I don't care what the standard is. And so while we were still compliant, we went the extra step. We put in the, uh, we got a grant, uh, thankfully, and we were able to put in an a, a automated door system. Uh, so find out what those ob obstacles are. Do you have people that are obstacles? Do you have some employees who, you know, they're the ones that are keeping you from delivering good customer service. You're going to need to figure out a way to correct that, or you're going to need to remove the obstacle. And develop a simple plan. What do we want to do? Who will be involved? When do we start? And for us, when we were getting ready to open the rec center, uh, my director, Bob Johnson, and I sat down, and it's like, you know, we've never done this before. How do we know we're even going to do it right? We're, this is a big risk we're taking opening up a recreation center. We don't even know if we'll be successful. And we both came to the conclusion, if we didn't have good customer service, that we weren't going to succeed. We were spending $16.5 million on a recreation facility, and we weren't sure if it was going to work. Uh, we didn't know if people would want to show up. But we knew that if we made people feel good about coming in, they'd want to keep coming back. So that meant that we had to start. So I got to go back to, to Disney World and go to the Disney's uh, customer service uh, program at the Disney Institute. And, started becoming a student of customer service. And that's what you may need to do. You, need, may, need, you may need to go go to some sort of course and, and, and do some study. Somebody's going to have to take the lead on that. And that's where you need at least one champion. Who's going to be your champion? Is it going to be you? Is there somebody else in your organization who's really into customer service? Maybe they're, they're your champion. If they work for you or they're your peer in your organization, you're going to need to get out of the way and let them do their thing. And you're going to need to bow to them when they say, this is how we need to do it. You know, let them be the one that's leading the charge. Commit to being a role model. Even if you're not the champion, you need to be modeling that good customer service and that good leadership. Um, I think, uh, well, okay, I haven't got there yet. Okay, so um, commit to ongoing trainings. and. We do probably two trainings a year on customer service. The flaw in our trainings right now is it's only when we're bringing on new people. So we just started uh, in, uh, in early January, earlier this month, we just started doing ongoing trainings. So now we're bringing in part-time staff who've already gone through our trainings, and now we're getting a little more intensive. We're doing more discussions and role playing. And Staff love it. They love the attention. They love the fact that they're, they're, uh, they're getting to be uh, trained a little further. And my goal by the summertime is to have some of the, our part-timers actually being involved as trainers. And they will actually be helping others to understand that. And to try and foster a culture of customer service so that even if I'm not around, it's still proliferating. Commit to being patient. This is going to take a while. And I had staff, full-time staff, that while they were on board with most of it, there were still a few issues that they struggled with when it came to customer service. And it had more to do with their role. Uh, you know, uh, when, you're a, when you're a manager, sometimes you have to get out of the way 
Uh, sometimes you're used to doing things, but sometimes you need to step back, and that was where they were having struggles, was stepping back and letting uh, uh, people who were, you know, the, the managers that were having a hard time letting the supervisor, the coordinator, or even the part-timers take on certain responsibilities and have certain authority. Treat your staff the way you want them to treat your customers. It's the golden rule stuff. If you're not the type of, of manager who treats people well, don't expect for them to treat the customers well. That's just that's the way it's going to be. But if you're treating them really well, they're, they're going to treat people well. Involve frontline staff in creating that customer service strategy just like I talked about. If you can do that, um, I, I think you'll be successful. I'm, I, I can't tell you how excited I am that I get the opportunity to do that. Your personnel policies acknowledge the importance of frontline staff. How many of you are in the habit of writing notes to your part-time staff and thanking them for work? One of the best, one of the best tips I ever got. Uh, anybody here read the book Creating Magic by Lee Cockrell? Uh, I highly recommend Creating Magic. It, the book came out in 2009, so it's fairly, uh, it's it's fairly relevant. It, it's very contemporary. He was the vice president of Walt Disney World, and most of our uh, most of our training is based on the Disney model. Um, and he has a chapter totally devoted to. Uh, Valuing your staff. Uh, it, it's a great read, um, and uh, you know if you can value your staff, you can let them know that through 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 kind gestures, through uh, notes. And, and, and I guess my point about the book was that he talked about how he would write handwritten. You know, the vice president was writing handwritten thank yous to staff when he would notice them doing something good. And I've gotten into the habit of doing that. I've created my own thank you card, a motivational quote or inspirational quote on there. And just a quick thank you. Hey, I saw you giving great customer service, or I heard about this, and I give it to them, and they love it. And I wasn't sure the impact was going to be all that good until I saw one of my staff who has a, a cubicle with with my note pinned up on his wall next to his family pictures. How cool is that? Empower frontline staff to make decisions, usually reserved for higher ranking staff. When I mentioned that some of my staff had a hard time with uh, letting go and, and buying into all of customer service. One of my rec managers, Paul, when I said, hey, why don't we let frontline staff, our part-time staff, approve uh, refunds? Somebody comes in, spends $25. Is there any reason why we could? Well, because I do that, was his response. That's my job. Well, what if we make it their job? If they don't have the authority. What if, do you trust them? Yes. And it took a while, but finally we got to the point where frontline staff, as long as we told them what to do, what the process was, they always made the right decision. It was easy to do, and they appreciated having the authority. It made their lives easier. Think of ways you could serve your frontline staff. Um, when we're real busy, uh, I, I ask my staff, make sure they have water at the front, bring them a bottle of water. If they're real busy with customers, how about going up and helping uh, scan cards in and, and checking uh, staff in? checking equipment. You can do some of the things that aren't involved with registration, but make their lives easier. Take some pressure off. How can you serve your frontline staff? It's more than courtesy. And when we started uh, looking at doing customer service for uh, the rec center, uh, Paul, I mentioned before, our rec manager, he came up with a list of what customer service meant to him. And it all had to do with smiling and being friendly. And while that's very important, and you can't have good customer service without that. It's more than courtesy. So if you think that's where it stops, it, 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 there's so much more to it. What's your customer service model? I mentioned ours is Disney. You've got Nordstrom. You've got uh, Zappos. Those are some good companies that have great customer service models. You could gravitate to any one of those and not, not go wrong. Training, training, training. Have your initial training, but then Develop a schedule. Revisit a lot of the things about customer service that you feel are important. Get your frontline staff involved in coming up with what we need to work on in customer service training. The infrastructure. What tools are in place that can help the customer in the absence of staff? Uh, what do you have in the absence of staff that aids in customer service? You all have it. I know you do. Who has a website? Everybody has a website. Um, so they're not at your building, they're not on the phone, but they can go online and they can get information about programs, right? Is it up to date? 
Yeah? How many times have you uh, checked your website and found, oh, that program ended two weeks ago or a month ago? Anybody have that happen? Yeah. No. You're not raising your hand, I know. But you're nodding. <laughs> and we, we have it. So I have our front desk staff at one of our facilities. It's not as busy as, as some of the others. Uh, they'll, they'll go ahead and they'll page by page go through the website to make sure everything's updated, make sure all the links work, uh, make sure that uh, information on upcoming programs that they know about is on the website. And uh, not only that, they're getting familiar with, with our uh, program uh, offerings. The other thing would be uh, registration. How many of you have online registration? So they don't always have to come down to the office now. They can do it right there online. What can be done to let the customer help themselves? That would be online registration. Um, how about in your facility? Uh, how many of you have a rec center with a fitness component? So there's a lot of things they can do in there for themselves, right? A lot of them will go in and they'll work out by themselves. Um, do you have uh, group fitness programs? Okay, so they can go in there. Do they have to be told everything what to do or can they just jump in and figure it out? They can help themselves, right? Lap swim. Anybody have lap swim? Now, we, we make sure that we've got the uh, uh, the, the things that you put between your legs for pulling when you're swimming and the kickboards are all there. Help yourself. Grab one. You can do whatever you want on laps with. You don't even have to, you don't even have to swim. You can just float if you want. But, but what, can, what can be done to help themselves? Do they know that? And the cost versus, versus benefit. It would be great if you could have a, a, a kiosk at every park where people could register for programs, you know, electronically or... Um, you could have a kiosk at every uh, facility, but you probably can't afford the, the cost of that. So you kind of have to weigh that. Um, for those of you who have uh, rec centers um, or parks, and I'm going to guess everybody here has one of the two, if not both, that's part of your infrastructure. You've made a huge investment in that park or that facility. To not have it be customer service friendly uh, is, is going to be a problem. Um, I know that there are there are parks in, in Sacramento across the river from West Sacramento. They're they're going through a terrible time. They've had so many cuts in uh, in their budget uh, and in their staff that it's getting real hard for them to to maintain parks to a real high level. And the approach right now is to try and, and cut off a lot of the, the real poor performing parks, but then to try and keep all the others afloat instead of focusing on those really high profile parks. Um, they're, they're kind of diluting the the, uh, uh, the attention that all of those parks are getting. And it, it has a negative effect on, on the users. So if you have a facility, what can you do to, to, to keep it going? In, in Colorado, when we were touring facilities there, um, one theme that came out is that every recreation facility closes down for a week sometime during the year. And they call it Hell Week. Because during Hell Week, uh, when it's closed, they are having to figure out where do our customers go for this week. So they're usually making arrangements for them to go somewhere else with, a, with another agency nearby. They're having to schedule the replacement of carpet, painting, uh, upgrading of, of uh, amenities and infrastructure, all in a week's time. So it's just absolutely the worst time to work there, but it's when they get everything done. Um, why wouldn't you spend some time at least painting the walls that have marks in them? Uh, in San Jose, I went to a, I did the same presentation in San Jose, and there was a wall behind the projector, and along the wall, you could see where chairs had gone up and created marks, and there were scuff marks from shoes, and it was an easy thing to point out. Why wouldn't you simply paint this? Get a gallon of paint and take care of it. And if we're not willing to do that, we're not showing that we care about our facilities, and that sends a message. When a place isn't clean, and when a place isn't kept up well, what do you think the customer might, might think? Don't care, anything else? What if you've got kids? Could be unsafe. Could be unsafe, exactly. You send a message that this place is safe, it's sanitary, uh, when you take care of your facilities. What do customers want? Um, now, are you asking them? You, you may have program evaluations. Everybody do program evaluations after you know, after basketball leagues, after after swim lessons, you all do that? Yeah, well, we do the same thing. But are you asking customers at other times? How many of you 
uh, walk around and talk to customers at your facilities or your parks? Do you do that? Are you asking them, hey, what do you think? How are we doing? If that's not part of your conversation, just add it. Hey, hey how could we do something better? Do you like what we did over here? What else would you like to see? Um, if you're not getting that constant feedback from people, you don't know how to improve. How si satisfied are customers with your services? Are you asking them? Uh, anybody here use SurveyMonkey to find out customer uh, satisfaction? Yeah, great tool, great tool. And I mentioned uh, before that we're, we're doing a, um, a focus group, and it's going to be all of our all of our pass holders that that, that want to show up and come and tell us what they think. How are we doing? Uh, once you have that information, how are you going to respond? And what we did is we we documented every complaint or request on a list, and then we. Um, we went ahead and we told them afterwards why we could do it or why, uh, why we couldn't. And if we did it, what we did and when it was done. So we just communicated with them and they, they really appreciated it. I mean, at our recreation center, we thought they were going to talk about, we want a shade structure over the bleachers at the pool, um, which we knew was already a need. But what came out of that is we would just like two more benches in the hallway by the group exercise room. Because when we have to wait, we have nowhere to sit. It was an easy fix, and it made them happy. The other thing was we would like one more drinking fountain uh, out by the, uh, the fitness center. Because the ones we have to go to are you know, about 30 feet away. It would be great if we could just walk outside the door and use a drinking fountain. When we told them we couldn't, we, we researched it, we told them what we did, then we told them that we just couldn't. The, the, the infrastructure wasn't there, and it would be cost prohibitive, pro prohibitive for us to do it. We do have the drinking fountain here, and by the way, we have filtered water up front. And they were satisfied with that. So, how are we doing on time? About 15 minutes? Let me go? Oh, perfect. Okay, so what I want you to do is you're going to get into those groups of four again that you had. And I'm going to show you a picture, and I want you in... And, and it says two minutes, we'll go five, because you really need a little more time. Um, everything that you see in that picture, I want you just to, okay, do this. Everybody get in your little groups right now. Okay. And on the count of three, on the count of three, everybody in your group, point to one other person in your group. One, two, three. Okay, whoever has the most fingers pointed at them, is your group surprise. They have That's democracy, people. Okay? So whoever whoever had the most fingers pointed at them, they're your scribe. And so what they're gonna do is they're gonna write down everything that you say in this group. And I want you when you look at this picture. If it's positive, negative, neutral, write it down. Whatever it is you think. And go. Yeah, I'm right here. 
picture what I'm told. Now this came this came off of my workbook from uh, the Disney Institute and what, what, I, what I was told was that on the anniversary of the park any staff or any of the cast members who were available they get together to do a, a picture like this. And so there's this big group photo and it's it's a lot of fun. You get to be a part of something that uh, that they use and uh, you know who, who doesn't like to be part of a big group photo? So before we leave we're going to do Brand Aid's biggest group photo for a class, all right? And that'll be memorable. And we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll certainly make an impact, uh, at least in, in my life. Okay, um, and so what came out of the what came out of the discussion? What are some of the uh, you know, what, what are some of the feelings and emotions that came out, or, or, or thoughts? Welcoming. Well, Welcoming. Okay. What else? Fine. What was the one? Fun. Fun. Happiest place on earth. Happiest place on earth. Magical. Very branded. Magical. Very branded. Engaged. Engaged. There's no wrong answers, by the way. Red carpet. <laughs> red carpet. Yeah, you've got the red carpet treatment. What else? Happiness. Happiness. I want to be there. <laughs> want to be there? Absolutely want to be there. I'm sorry, what was that one? Involved. Okay, yeah. You're, you're part of the show. You know, if you're in this group, that's what's so much fun about being a part of this group picture. You're part of the you're part of the action. You're there. Organized. Organized. Celebration. Celebration. It's clean. It's, clean. it's very clean. Um, in, in Anaheim, they figured out uh, on Main Street, they, they actually figured out that if people walk more than 25 feet, I think it was 25 feet. Anyway, if you go there, the garbage cans are only are, are every so many feet apart. They figured out that after so many feet, people would simply drop trash and they didn't have a place to put it. So, you know, so they're helping the customer help themselves. Uh, what else? Memories. Memories, absolutely. How many of you have been to Walt Disney World or Disneyland? Who hasn't been yet? Okay, you all have homework. <laughs> you have to go. All right, uh, yeah, well, I didn't say that. Uh, what else? Imagination. Dreamlike. Dreamlike. Colorful. Colorful. Okay. Hey, pardon? Debt. 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 It's expensive. <laughs> well, I thought you said dead. That's a lot. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's expensive. Disney makes no apologies for, for the cost. They know it's expensive. They know that families, and this is what we were being told, they know that families are gonna are gonna save two, three, five years for that next trip. They they know that. Think about that. There's value. People are willing to save money to do to go to Disney World and Disneyland because of the value they get. Because it's clean, because they're well treated, because it's fun, because of the memories, all the things that you guys have listed. Don't we do that? And how many of us are reluctant to charge a little bit more? Oh, if we charge, you know, if we go from 50 cents to a dollar, uh, aren't we worth it? Yes. You know, we, uh, for some reason with parks and recreation, and I think it's because we sell ourselves short. 
We do. We sell ourselves short. We have something that people want. If we really believe in it, we're passionate about it, and, 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 and we can allow people to be part of the show and to enjoy it, probably going to pay for it. What about, how many of you have been to um, Florida? Well, I don't need to tell you guys. You have humidity here in Texas, I guess. <laughs> but if you've ever been to Florida, it's the same way. It's, it's, it's hot. So you're at Disney World. You're running around. There's thousands of people there who are sweating just like you. It can be a little icky, right? Um, what about, a lot of lights are on during the day. A little wasteful maybe, I mean there's a lot of energy being used. Okay, um, it's crowded. Very. Okay, so what are some of the other things that when you looked at that you thought, you know, maybe you just haven't said crowded, what else? Strollers. Strollers. Yeah, yeah everywhere. Lines. 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 Pardon? It's corny. It's corny. <laughs> Absolutely, it's corny. Crying kids. Crying kids, meltdown. All ages. Men wearing shirts they shouldn't be wearing. Grandparents. Yeah. Grandparents, yeah. Uh, did you know that in uh, in uh, Disney, any, any and sorry to say this, but anytime there's a, somebody throws up on a ride, uh, it's called a protein spill. So if you ever hear them say protein spill over at this ride, you know what's happened. But they, you know, they got the message out. So they know what they're talking about. It's kind of cute for, for throw up. Uh, uh, what about anybody here? See anybody they know? Anybody familiar? Any familiar faces? Who? Mickey and Minnie. Mickey and Minnie. And Donald. And Donald. And who the dog over there? So in this image, there are people you know. And don't your customers like to go someplace where they're recognized, where they, you know, people know them. And I, I, that's what I love about our staff, the fact that they can call customers by name and there's that relationship. And I honestly believe if that were gone, we probably would lose people. People want to be recognized and they want to feel welcome and they want to feel like they belong. And if you can make them part of the show, all the better. Um, I, yesterday in my session, I, I talked about our Facebook page and how we do... Uh, we do some, uh, every once in a while we'll do picture days. We'll go around, we'll take pictures of people. And we'll give them toys to play with, like we did lightsabers for Star Wars Day. Uh, for Talk Like a Pirate Day, we had a little call-out sign where they were, for International Talk Like a Pirate, argh, and they could make a pirate face. And they loved it. They loved playing with us. But they liked being part of the show because they eventually ended up on our Facebook page and they were, they were part of Parks and Recreation. They, they had a, a bigger place in it. They weren't just a customer. They were a, a player in our, in our show. Um, so, and let me find my clicker here. So I do this um, red carpet exercise, and this was just kind of something that just kind of developed uh, in, in West Sacramento, and it, it turned out to be a pretty good tool as kind of our our initial customer service. It's where we tried to get the idea of what customer service meant, and for us, it means no making those positive emotional connections where people feel supported and they feel like we care and that they're getting their needs met and their problems solved. If we can do all of those things, we're going to keep our customers and they're going to be loyal and they're going to, but most of all, they're going to, they're going to return again and again and again and again. So um, online, uh, on the branding, it's not there yet, but I'll try to have everything on there this afternoon. You can go and find this session and you should be able to find this actual, uh, there's, there's actual training to watch you through how you can do this. You certainly don't have to follow the directions. If you can do it better, great. Uh, but it's a, it's a starting point for you if you want to use it. So we also do this. We have each each employee gets a uh, our, our seven service uh, guidelines. So it's make eye contact and smile, greet and welcome each and every guest, seek out guest contact, provide immediate service recovery. You see a problem, go over there and find out how you can help. Don't don't turn a blind blind eye to it. Display appropriate body language at all times. You know, we actually have to coach people not to sit there with their hands in their pockets and, and lean against the wall. How can you look like you're ready to go? Uh, preserve the fun and exciting guest experience. We have Mui Armstrong. He's our mascot for uh, Parks and Rec in West Sacramento. And I've told everybody, we preserve the magic. We, you know, Mui is Mui. Mui's not somebody in the costume. Mui is not this person this day and this person the other day. And you never, you never let Mui see, be seen without his head on or without his gloves on. Mui is Mui. So we preserve the magic that way. 
The other way you can do that, how many of you have facilities where, where cleaning supplies or supplies that have been delivered are viewable to the customer? Hide them. Put them back behind a door. The customer doesn't need to see your cleaning supplies or the things that were just delivered. Uh, thank you to each and every guest. And I, I ask staff, when people are leaving, hey, thanks for coming in today. We'll see you tomorrow. Great customer service is how we help our guests realize our brand promise of parks make life better. So excellent customer service practices, plus understanding your customer service values, wants, needs, and responding to them. Helps your customers realize the values of your programs and services. Doing these things help deliver on the brand promise of Parks Make Life Better. If you want to use Parks Make Life Better as your brand for your organization, only one person in your organization needs to be a CPRS member. It is a benefit of being a California Park and Recreation Society member. If one person does it though, your whole agency can use that brand. You may want to go somewhere else and I encourage you to find out what your brand is. What are your customers saying you are? But if it just happens to be this, you could use this by simply becoming a CPRS member. Uh, and I wasn't asked to tell you that. I'm just telling you that's, that's how it works. So thank you for your participation. And if we could, I'd like to get everybody, if you're willing, come on up to the front. And Justin has agreed to take a group picture of us. And we're going to put this on the Brand Aid site. And we'll, it'll be, in fact, you guys want to do it like Disney did? And all have our hands up? It'd be kind of fun, huh? So everybody just kind of move to the edge here of the aisle and we'll all, yeah, we'll all do our hand up. Let me find Justin here real quick. Okay. And it's great if you, can, if you can get in, so we probably need to be a little wider at the back and a little more narrow at the end. If we can see your face, so if you can't see the camera, peek in. Put your hand in, make a goofy face, whatever you gotta do. Where's the projector? Um, is, it, uh, is it a problem? I don't know how to turn it off. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Okay, one more, one more. This is for me. <laughs> I want to remember you all. <laughs> One, two, three. Pause, make life better. Hey, I like that. Okay. I got like four. When you get a chance, go to the Brand Egg Facebook page. If you have Facebook, tag yourself in this picture. Let's blow it up. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you.